Okay, so folks, let's go ahead and jump right into it. So I'm going to I'm going to introduce um, introduce our guest. It's a little bit difficult because she is um, she is a woman of many of many um, of many accolades uh, here, and so I'll just uh, I'll just pick out a few little a few little factoids that I am that I am discovering. So Dr. Tara Isabella Burton is a contributing editor at the American Interest. Uh, let's see, her de debut novel, Social Creature, was pra praised by New York Times, uh, by New York Times' Janet Maslin as a, quote, wicked original with echoes of the greats, unquote, was published by Doubleday and Bloomsbury Raven in the, in the UK in June 2018. Her more recent book, Strange Rights, New Religions for a Godless World, explores the rights and practices of the religiously unaffiliated from soul cycle to witchcraft. Uh, published, uh, well, it's out now. Um, let's see, it was out as of May 2020. It was praised by the Benedict Options' Rod Dreher, somebody I'm a fan of, as one of the most important books of the year. She currently writes a column on the same topic, Religion Remixed, for Religion News Service and is a contributing editor at The American Interest. She's written on religion, culture, and plays for the New York Times, National Geographic, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, City Journal, the Economist, 1843, uh, Aeon, the BBC, the Atlantic, Salon. Tara, this list is just too long. I think that people want to know more. They just need to. They just need to look you up. Just every impressive publication you can imagine. She's been, she's been featured in. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, we are very happy to be joined by Tara Isabella Burton. Tara, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing well. Uh, yes, uh, surviving. I'm, I'm in a hotel room with AC, which I don't have at home, and it's it's hmm. just a revelation. So. Very glad to be both here and also here with you. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for thank you for saying both things. Yeah, we're glad to have you here in general and here specifically. So, you know, um, yeah, wonderful. Okay, now, um, Tara, uh, do you want to um, lead uh, for us with something of a general presentation of sure? Okay. So. What I was sort of thinking that I do rather than read from the book directly is talk a little bit about the book and in particular about some of the issues that uh, the book raises. So Strange Rights, New Religions for a Godless World is uh, ostensibly about the religiously unaffiliated, which is to say the 24% of so or so of Americans who tick on the religion box, uh, nothing in particular or none. Um, but this is not a book about um, American secularism or the problem of, uh, despite the tricky title, a godless world. Rather, it's a look at what I think is a change in American religious life that traditional political discourse, which is to say discourse about secularism, is America getting less religious? Are we, uh, which often just means less Christian, um, often obscures. So uh, a couple of numbers just to situate you. 23 to 24%, as I said, that's the percentage of Americans who identify as religiously unaffiliated or um, often called the N-O-N-E-S, the nuns, as opposed to the Catholic nuns, very different. Um, however, uh, when you look at Americans born after 1985, that number jumps to 36%. Among LGBTQ Americans, that goes up to 46%. So almost half of queer Americans say they don't belong to any religious tradition. Um, so there's one version of this is just that people are, quote unquote, leaving religion, they're leaving faith behind, they're becoming atheists, agnostics, nothing. That's actually not true. So only about 3% or so of Americans say they're atheists. Now it is true that atheists often self under report, but 72% of the religiously unaffiliated in America say they believe in some sort of a higher power. 17% furthermore say they believe in the God of the Bible. So what do you do with that information? Um, the question, you know, you have people say, well, I believe in, in this God or I believe in something, but I'm not part of an organized tradition. Um, how do we make sense of that data? Separately, there's another issue here that is related to the first question, which is that the just looking at the religiously unaffiliated or even the quote unquote spiritual but not religious as about 25%, sorry, 20% of the population calls themselves isn't the whole story. Um, another poll, 2018 Pew, found that about 30% of, of self-identified Christians say they believe in reincarnation. Now, 
according to pretty much any orthodox understanding of Christian doctrine. Those, those two um, tenets are, are not reconcilable with one another. But, you know, almost a third of Christians say they, they believe in both. So what, what I argue in the book is that to think about the religiously unaffiliated is to overlook a more uh, pressing, a broader and more pertinent category, which is what I call the religiously remixed. These are people who are, um, as the data suggests, young, tend younger, um, tend exclusively, but not completely, more politically progressive, um, who are, resist the tenets of institutional religion, organized religion, and yet essentially want to mix and match, unbundle, imagine, make their own religion. Um, this is a group of people that are driven by um, a distrust of authority, a distrust of doctrine and uh, top-down hierarchical models of religion that someone tells you what to believe and you assent to that. Um, they're driven by a sense, and as I'll go on to say in just a little bit, um, is very deep, I'd argue, in the American religious consciousness that they're sort of the self is authoritative, that our instincts, our desires, our longings are um, more reflective of divinity within us than anything else. Um, and they take they basically sort of interact with the world around them to form their own faiths. Uh, the Harvard Divinity School scholars, uh, Casper Turquoila and Angie Thurston, have talked about the phenomenon of unbundling as in a cable package. The idea that you sort of put together your own faith from exactly the, the practices and the rituals and the beliefs that you want. Um, so someone might go to Shabbat dinners with their families, but practice taro um, and yoga and sage cleansing and so on and so forth. Um, so a, a couple caveats before we talk about the remixed. Uh, one is the way in which this has a very distinctive history in America specifically, which is to say that throughout American religious history, there has been, and I, this is what I argue in the book, a tension between um, institutionalist and intuitionalist um, strains of uh, religious expression. And at various points through American history, be it the uh, First and Second Great Awakenings, uh, be it the uh, phenomenon of new thought and spiritualism to big uh, kind of quasi-occult crazes of the 19th century. And in each case, the, the rhetoric of these movements goes something like this. People go to church on Sundays, they observe this kind of civil religion, but they don't really believe it. They don't, it doesn't really have meaning for them. What we need is something personal, something um, focused on an individual emotional relationship with the divine. And we need to kind of revive this in American religious life. We see this both in uh, Christian forms of this expression, which is to say, um, uh, Methodist circuit writers or tent revivalists, but we also see it in um, things like New Thought, which for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, I highly recommend uh, you, you check it out. It's fascinating. Uh, it's this 19th century movement that kind of is a prototype of uh, modern self-help movements by like The Secret that basically says, you know, if you can think it, if you meditate on success or health, or uh, wealth, it will happen. And if it doesn't happen, it's because you're not believing hard enough. And this uh, became enormously popular in like the 1860s or so. Um, Mary Baker Eddy, of Chris, the Chris, who later founded the Christian Science uh, Movement, was a, was a devotee of Phineas Quimby, the original um, proponent of this mindset. And then throughout the 20th century, there was a whole cottage industry of uh, self-help books, uh, particularly popular in the Gilded Age, that would say like, this is how you get a lot of money. This is how you get wealth. It is through practicing these principles. Uh, among the most famous proponents is the um, Christian pastor, Norman Vincent Peale. Um, but I digress. Anyway, um, these are, so we have um, this tendency, this intuitionalism rooted in American religious life. But what we're seeing right now is a kind of intense, not just an intensification, but kind of it kicking into overdrive. And uh, why? Uh, there's two reasons. So I would argue that the, the first and the most pertinent here is the internet and is 
um, there's this sort of truism that the Protestant Reformation is inextricable from the development of the printing press. And various scholars will sort of have, take that view more or less strongly, but the fundamental argument is something along the lines of the inwardness, the sense of a kind of private life that the proliferation of um, uh, literacy engendered lent itself to a certain way of looking at the world. Um, I would argue that what we're seeing now in this uh, fifth great awakening, as it were, is the kind of transformation of the internet into American religious life. The remixed religions we're seeing with their focus on individualization, of mixing and matching and kind of uh, playing around with traditions, um, doing a sort of a little bit of this, a little bit of that, so much of that fluidity comes out of a culture, an internet culture, where mixing and matching and this kind of play is the norm. I think it's very telling that sort of the, those born after 1985, that really uh, the, the generations that have grown up with the internet, with internet culture, with the kind of participatory culture um, that surrounds how we do everything. From our, our media, we, you know, fan culture is, is not just a, a passive incident of us receiving text, but rather this sort of very active, very vocal uh, force that often shapes the, the course of um, creators' narratives. It's how we, we get our news, um, algorithms that are specifically designed to show us information from like-minded sources. It's how we watch media. If you like this, you'll, you'll also like something you might see on Amazon or Netflix. Le excuse me, Netflix. And that lends itself to, to our um, religious life. And the second, and perhaps more sort of controversial, but, but I, I double down on it, element of why I think that this uh, particular element in religious life is distinctive is the sort of particular late capitalist obsession with, um, with personal choice as constitutive of ourselves. What we choose, uh, particularly through the uh, lens of what we consume and how we choose through consumption and even through attention, which in the attention economy of the internet translates to money, uh, page views, clicks, eyeballs as capital, uh, lends itself to an approach to spirituality that is a kind of building of a personal brand. Who am I? The same way, for example, whether I read a uh, Vox.com or the American conservative might say something about me, whether I have my New Yorker tote bag, whether I, um, you know, participate in any one of a number of forms of self-making through consumption. So too does the kind of contemporary American spiritual um, tendency often find its fulfillment in uh, what we buy, what brands we interact with. A 2018 study by um, the branding arm of the media company Vice, which is called Virtue, which sounds like it would be a joke, but it is not, that is what it is called, found that about 54% of Americans say they want to support um, brands that can um, enhance their soul. It's pretty tall order. 77% uh, say they want at least to shop at brands that share their values. Um, so whether it's the kind of purchase of wellness as a kind of spiritual concept, what we see in spending $40 on a soul cycle class, an exercise spinning class, or a $260 a month membership to somewhere like Equinox, a high-end gym that really focuses on the kind of wellness self-care rhetoric, whether it's um, what's often kind of um, der derogatorily called woke capitalism, but the idea that brands... Uh, might ally with social justice movements such as Black Lives Matter in order to kind of create a vision of themselves as um, socially uh, aware and therefore kind of selling a, a fantasy of, um, of, of a moral community. Um, and you can see that too with them um, sort of conversely something like um, Goya or, or Chick-fil-A where, where they're sort of uh, attracting a more conservative uh, customer base. Uh, what we buy and how we interact financially with the world is a, so much of a bigger element of this mix and match. You know, the, the spiritual marketplace in this case is quite literal. So um, John, I'm really looking forward to uh, talking with you more and, and sort of answering your questions. But uh, for those of you who, who are sort of perhaps coming to this topic for the first time or not for the first time, I, I kind of want to keep at the forefront of this conversation. Um, if, I, if I leave you with nothing else, uh, just a sense that the narratives of 
godlessness secularism in America might be, to my mind, the, ru the rumors of the secular America are, are greatly exaggerated. Um, and that actually what we are seeing is sort of an internetification, a digital reformation, a reimagining of American uh, religious life as remixing. That is, it is, it looks different from religion as we traditionally understand it, but it should still be taken seriously as a religious phenomenon rather than a secular one. Over to you, John. <laughs> mm, okay, so I have a few, first of all, thank you. That was, that was um, terrifically filling and, um, you're making a lot of points that, um, frankly, are sort of new formulations to me. So I have a few uh, table setting questions for you. Well, one, just very quickly, um, is there, so is the, the statistical spread of varying um, religious or non-religious affiliations, various ways of defining our religious commitments as say being spiritual, but not religious or being, Christian, but embracing beliefs that come outside of more orthodox or conventional sort of Christian dogma. Is this, um, is this a particularly American phenomenon, or do you see a broad parallel in Western Europe and other similar, uh, similar civilizations? It's absolutely distinctively American. Um, one of my favorite statistics, and, and I don't have the exact numbers in my head, so I'm, I'm, I'm approximating here, but um, more religiously unaffiliated Americans score on, I think there's what's called a religiosity index. So things like talking to God, uh, private prayer, et cetera. Um, Amer the, the spirit, the, not even the spiritual, but not religious, just the, the, the nuns of America score higher on that index than uh, self-identified Christians in Western Europe. Mm, yes. So it's, it's you know, much more likely that someone in, Denmark or Italy might say, like, I'm a Christian. Also, this is part of my cultural heritage, such that, you know, this is just what it means. There's that sort of joke about in the Church of England, you know, you don't know what to say on the forum or nothing, just put Church of England. Um, that That's a sort of very much a phenomenon. That's much less the case in the United States. Um, but there is also, I think, this sort of intense interest in forms of spirituality, traditional and non-traditional, that is also distinctive to America. One thing I, I did not notice in your analysis was any, any particular qualitative judgment about this phenomenon. So, in other words, uh, usually when I hear the more conventional sort of analysis, which you, uh, you know, uh, which you reference, this idea that Americans are becoming, you know, more secular, therefore less religious, that is usually followed by a comment that says, and that's a bad thing, or, and that's a good thing, right? And, you know, for various, various reasons we can, we can track. Um, in your case, I see you identifying a phenomenon. It seems to be the case in your overview that Americans are not becoming less religious, but that our, relig our religion is manifesting in, in new and different ways. Do you have a qualitative sort of opinion on this? Is this a good or bad thing in the aggregate, or is it just too is it just too complicated to weigh in with a quick opinion on that? So I, the way that I would frame that is that it is a natural and understandable result of a bad thing, which is to say, um, the way that I understand it is not sort of, and I think this is another sort of tempting narrative, like young people who are inherently selfish or narcissistic and they're taking a lot of selfies and they want kind of their religion to be as bespoke as their internet profile. Um, rather, I see this as a, a story of institutional failure, which is to say, um, you know, not just in a church, uh, sorry, our public trust is massively down, particularly in young people in churches, but also in our civic leaders, in our journalistic establishment, in our, um, you know, in our police, in our media, there is really no sort of element of civic life that scores highly on me metrics of public trust. Right. And I think in that paradigm, when you can't rely on anybody else, you can't rely on uh, your, your priest, uh, you can't rely on your elected leaders, um, the sort of inward turn to, well, I'm all I can rely on. And my instincts, my gut feelings should be kind of divinized in some way. Um, that seems like a perfectly rational response. So I would want to condemn the conditions that kind of led us here. 
Um, and I think also, I think the way in which um, religious institutions have systematically failed, including uh, systematically failed um, vulnerable populations. I mean, I think the fact that um, Americans who don't call themselves straight are twice as likely to be unaffiliated as uh, the national average is very telling. Um, so, you know, for full disclosure, I, I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm an Episcopalian, I do write from that perspective. Um, and, you know, I'm, I, I don't kind of celebrate the, uh, the, the decline of Christianity in some abstract way. At the same time, I think, I think that the kind of, I, I don't think is necessarily bad or, or to be condemned that people, particularly those who are, are do not, have not felt welcome in traditional religious institutions, are seeking out new forms of gathering. Um, what I do condemn, and condemn sort of wholeheartedly, is the way in which a certain capitalist idea of the personal brand has commodified our religious impulses, and in the kind of freedom that comes from an anti-institutional uh, religious environment, the freedom of the religious marketplace has lent itself to a world in which our hunger for moral community, for ritual, for purpose, for meaning, have been kind of taken up as advertising slogans. And that is the part, the point that I sort of come down on saying, like, this is nightmarish and, um, and you know, whatever one thinks of the, the content of, of a, a certain advertisement, um, the idea that our sort of moral arbiters are corporations uh, who want to sell us fantasies of a better world are like should give anyone pause regardless of their views on uh, organized religion. Mm. So the, um, the, the French sociologist Emile Durkheim defined religion as, by the way, I'm not I don't have a great memory. I'm just reading this here. So don't be too impressed with it, buddy. But Durkheim defined religion as, quote, a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things, uh, things set apart and forbidden, beliefs and practices which unite in one single moral community called a church, all those who adhere to them. Um, the thing that stands out to people about his definition of religion there is that it avoids um, reference to God or the supernatural. I I'm just wondering, it, it sounds to me like that definition of religion is overlaps pretty well with the way you're engaging the term, yes. would it be fair to say? Sure. So um, I will say um, there are as many scholars of religion, definitions of religion as there are scholars of religion. There is no one unified normative definition of what religion is. There's a sort of like it's kind of like porn, you know it when you see it um, approach. That said, in my book, I talk about, I, I reference Durkheim, I reference um, Geertz. Um, there are sort of, fig sort of formative figures in the field that I, I present to say, like, here are some, some scholars, and, and Durkheim's is very much about the community and not about the substance of belief. Um, sort of, I kind of sidestep the issue in my book by talking about um, meaning, purpose, ritual, and community as elements of religious life. I'm looking about where these might be found in um, our contemporary godless world. Um, that said, where I would depart from Durkheim a little bit, or rather where I would want a slight difference in emphasis, is that I think that, that we, we can talk meaningfully about implicit theologies in a lot of these movements that don't have formal tenets, which is to say wellness culture. Like, there is no god of wellness culture. There is no formal metaphysical system. There is no origin story. But there is a kind of collective um, kind of set of images, rhetoric, that I think coalesces into a theology. The idea um, that you find throughout wellness culture of what I call best selfism. So, you know, your innate self is divine. The, uh, the world is kind of out to get you in some way. Society is out to get you this kind of post-transcendentalist like vision of human independence and freedom where, you know, the way to kind of become a better person, a more enlightened person, is to practice a form of self-care and self-betterment that makes you your best self. And that is not merely a practical thing. You're richer or more attractive and that gets you the things you want, but actually a de facto moral good. You're doing this for yourself because this is the right thing to do and you're in touch with the energy of the universe. And while not every, you know, 
boutique fitness studio exactly holds to all of this. Um, I think that it's fair to say that this kind of mentality, these stories about who we are, what we need, what we want, the sources of what's holding us back, is pretty common across wellness culture. So yes, I think I agree with Durkheim that we should have a kind of approach to religion that does focus on the communal aspects or its function sociologically, but I, I would motion that if we look for theology, if we look for kind of an implicit metaphysic, however, um, in vaguely, um, or rather how, however, still in formation, uh, we will find things uh, to talk about. Mm, okay. Yeah, I have, I have no doubt that we will find things to, things to talk about if you look at the sort of deep structures that are present in some of these, um, some of these different sorts of, you know, I guess, religious generations that you're, that you're itemizing for us. Um, I guess one of the things that um, strikes me is that part of what makes um, American religion distinctive, you talked about the Great Awakenings. Um, you know, there is no, uh, there, there's no real history of revivalism uh, in, in uh, European uh, Christianity and in the Catholic Church so much. I mean, I guess you could, I'm no great scholar or authority on this history, but you can look at Savonarola or something during the Borgias and see moments where suddenly religiosity becomes defined by the experience of spiritual phenomena. But that, I think, really is something that defines the Christian, the Protestant experience in the United States. But you referred to this rise of sort of intuitionist religion and it's kind of, you know, blending with the other parts of our um, cultural life in America as sort of a natural consequence of the failure of our institutions. Is there something about the American religious gene to begin with that might not be a bit subversive of institutions to begin with, given the fact that we descend from, you know, a stream of America, of Christian tradition that rejected the foremost institution of, of Christianity? Yes, I mean, I, I absolutely do think that there is something about the American national religious character that kind of lends itself to our response to kind of institutional failure being this, this sort of like, let's make our own um, energy rather than a kind of resignation or, or kind of collective eye roll. I mean, I do think that certainly, and you know, there, there's sort of a lot of reasons for it from the, the separation of church and state to the geographical expansiveness of America um, that make it so. Um, but I think that it is fair to say that the American character, um, at least you know, religiously and, and more broadly, has always been um, or has often been distrustful of, of institutions more broadly and sort of paired that distrust in institutions with a real optimism in the power of the individual. It's not the sort of, well, the system is broken, you know, let's drink some vodka and look out into the abyss and enjoy life while we can. Um, it is very much a sense of, you know, I could be the person to, to get it all right. I could be the person to, to put it all together. Um, the same way I think conspiracy theories are, are, are so popular in, in the United States now is, is partly because of that double mentality of everyone in power is lying to you but like, I'm the one who can figure out the truth. And you see it in like Dan Brown novels and you see it in, in Bruce Willis in Die Hard, the, uh, the sort of the outsider who, who manages to uh, be victorious by virtue of his uh, intuition is like a stock character in our, in our national mythology. Mm. Um, as we get to the, uh, as we get to the Q and A segment, I'm going to be, I'll be interested in hearing if any of our, uh, if, if, if any of our, um, well, if any of you folks are interested in sharing anything about your own kind of particular relationship to religion and how it expresses itself and, you know, in your own, in your own, um, in your own life, there's a lot in what you're describing, Tara, that <laughs> speaks to the American in me in terms of my own, you know, my own relationship to 
religion, spirituality, I'll say about myself very quickly that um, I, um, both of my parents come from vaguely Methodist backgrounds in very different contexts. Uh, my dad is, uh, my dad is baby boomer, born in 1950 from Tennessee, originally uh, grew up very affluent. Uh, my mother is from inner city Los Angeles from a more traditional um, black sort of background. Both of them kind of did not take church life very seriously. I grew up thinking of myself as agnostic, but my mother uh, was sort of a mystic kind of, you know, new age sort of person. There was, you know, a fair bit of dream interpretation in my mother's house uh, growing up and, you know, reading of tea leaves and so forth, so to speak. Actually, <laughs> maybe being more literal than not. Um, my father's religion was music. You know, my father uh, never had any particular relationship to organized religion, but he was a musician from a musical family and, and um, all life was, you know, all reality was a metaphor for music. Music is a metaphor for, was a metaphor for all things for me growing up. And so myself, I came to religion in a more formal sense later in life. After growing up agnostic, I started studying classical philosophy, metaphysical philosophy, Plato, Aristotle. I passed through new age spirituality for a time. Um, and uh, that was my first regular religious community. And it wasn't until meeting uh, the woman who I would marry, who was from a traditional Black Baptist sort of background, that I got engaged in a more traditional sort of version of Protestant Christianity and found something of a home there. But I, re I relate to this idea that as Americans, we kind of want to, you know, deconstruct what doesn't seem to be working and then figure things out and kind of rebuild things anew. I'm wondering if you could shine a light at all on any sort of personal religious kind of, you mentioned that you're from an Episcopalian background and that you grew up in that way. Do you have, um, do you have oh. a... Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so, so I actually fit the profile of someone who, who really should be a religious nun, which is to say I was, I was raised Episcopalian-ish. Um, I was raised, uh, my, my mother's family is Jewish. Um, my, my father's family is Catholic, although my mother and father were not together, so it's really just me and my mom. Um, and uh, we sort of went to like our local Episcopal church for Christmas and Easter. There were a couple of years where like I went to Sunday school a bit. Um, but really, the, the environment I was raised in was this very sort of traditional, nothingy, like, be nice to people, don't murder anybody, the uh, Gospels are good stories, like, did Jesus really come back from the dead? Probably not, but, like, metaphorically, sure. Um, this was very much part of, of the religious, or and an understanding of religion as, like, church was, was somewhere you went to get family values, rather than uh, a place that you went. To, to kind of like hear a spiritual, um, you know, a, a difficult truth about metaphysical world. Um, so there's again a sort of uh, a narrative, a false narrative that people who leave organized religion um, do so because it's uh, repressive, uh, oppressive, tyrannical, like too demanding. That is, is true in some cases. Again, I think the example of queer Americans is really important here, that, that there are certainly people who leave faith behind because it's, um, you know, somewhere they're not, um, they, 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 they sort of feel that they're marginalized uh, quite fairly. Um, at, I mean, fairly, they feel that way. Um, but there's the sort of more common story, statistically, is that, um, it's sort of a second generation phenomenon that if you grow up in a home, and this is, these are studies done on, on Protestants in America specifically, um, but it would not be surprising if this holds true more broadly, but that if you're raised in a kind of home where your parents are like, eh, it's not that important. So either I think the, the, the data showed if you're from a home where religion is not often spoken of, or if you're in a, an interfaith home where sort of both faiths or neither faith is practiced, but there isn't one dominant faith, you're more likely to leave um, all, all religion. And that makes sense. I and mean, sort of, I think the narrative there is like, well, if it's not that important, you know, if we can take it or leave it, why not just, you know, spend my Sunday morning, like, meditating, or, or going for a walk, or volunteering in a soup kitchen. And that sort of, that sort of the flow into religious unaffiliation is sort of the product of, like, parents who might check the box on a form, but if you look a little more closely, aren't observing themselves. So that was what, how I grew up. Um, went uh, 
full circle, which is to say I, I studied theology for about 10 years at, uh, in Oxford, um, and I um, got into witchcraft. I did the, uh, I did the witch thing. I did the uh, the tarot cards and the the sort of neo paganism. I was involved in you know a lot of intense sort of fan culture and getting really invested in uh, immersive theater in New York City. Um, almost every group I profile in in the book, um, I've been part of at, at one point in my life. Um, and my personally, I ended up kind of going back to um, extremely high church uh, Anglo Catholic Christianity, and and you know. I, I, am, I was a professional theologian. It wasn't totally out of the blue, but it was, you know, certainly more traditional, although again, my, my church is sort of, you know, it's, it's queer affirming, it's politically progressive in many ways, but, you know, we have our Latin and we have our incense and, and we, um, you know, have extremely like right one liturgy. And that's very much something that, you know, on the one hand, perhaps was a reaction to or resistance to the other kind of traditions I was involved in, however briefly. Um, but there's a part two in which I do fit the sort of profile of the millennial seeker, um, where I, I had very little default. I was exposed to a lot of different things, and I, I sort of did choose one. And one could uncharitably say that, you know, that's just an, another example, albeit a slightly more like old fashioned looking one um, of a model in which we construct our spiritual identities and choose them and kind of shop for them. So I think I, I, my, my case, myself as a case study perhaps is, is both a resistance to and an exemplification of, of the trends I'm describing. Hmm. Is there value? Um, so you have, um, so, so you've, you, you've laid out these patterns by which we are discovering new forms of religiosity and you and I have some things in common in terms of <laughs> kind of the zigging and the zagging towards we've, uh, where we've wound up here, but a big part of what animated my own personal journey, uh, which is still unfolding, you know, by the way, but a big part of what sort of has animated my own personal journey, um, with respect to religion and belief has been, has been contemplation of the metaphysical question, right? So clearly we can have religiosity, I guess, religiosity without sort of formal belief in a, in a higher power, right? Um, nevertheless, I think that for many believers and non-believers, part of what explains the popularity of the conversations that Jordan Peterson is having with Sam Harris and, you know, that um, I, I sort of, in my own kind of coming to terms with things found fascinating and following the dialogues of Christopher Hitchens and, you know, and, and various believers and so forth. This question over, you know, whether or not there is a God and is there importance to that subject, to that idea? I guess my question for you is, is there value in the God part of this conversation? Is that an indispensable part ultimately, or should we look at that as in indispensable to sort of the evolution of the religious conversation, or can we can we feel uh, comfortable or complacent with the idea of embracing a sense of religion or religiosity that you know sort of takes that as kind of uh, not a central not a central piece of you know what we want to develop within ourselves as religious people of one fashion or another. So I have, I have two answers for that. And one is from the perspective of a kind of journalist. So my, with my journalist and sociologist hat on, what I would say is um, there are narratives, uh, affecting narratives that function uh, successfully as, um, as religions that give people a source of meaning that do not have explicit um, divine metaphysic. Um, and I think, you know, some good 20th century, 20th century, uh, 20th century examples. So communism was one, um, you know, I, I, there's a really great book that, that was reissued this summer of Vivian Gornick's The Romance of American Communism, which is this personal history of her family through the lens of someone who's a child of American communists, sort of looking at the, the rapture and the ecstasy of the movement through the eyes of people who've been through it. Um, you know, one could say something of, about uh, today's social justice movement, similarly utopian, similarly um, 
structured with a, with a vision of a, a sort of eschatological vision. And I think that as long as it has an eschatological vision, um, rather than the pure inwardness we might find, let's say, wellness culture, which is so solipsistic, which is so nihilistic, which is just about the kind of the self-self-betterment in time, um, it has lasting power. Um, as a theologian and as a Christian theologian, I would say that um, I can't, I, I almost can't make sense of the question because however, whatever system we might make of the world to functionally get through the day, um, some of them are based on things that are true and some of them are not, and uh, something might be a functional narrative. Um, but I think, you know, if, if one does believe that um, there is a God and God exists and, you know, God became man and what have you, um, I, I think that, of course, uh, you have to draw a distinction between, you know, something might work uh, and, and not still be, be true. Uh, and so my reservation, again, speaking, more as a journalist or on the journalistic side of things is that many, not all, but many kind of modern um, religious, quasi-religious movements of this kind um, are without a clear sense of a sort of, 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 of a sort of founding theology, of a coherent systematic metaphysic. Um, are, you know, we, we've talked a bit about the sort of implicit metaphysic of, of best selfism or into, into, into intuitionalism in wellness. Um, I think the, they're likely to fall apart under strain in part because they are a bit, um, they don't have the kind of systematic uh, sense of like, why is the world this way? And how do all these things fit together? And how should my sexual life and my family life and my economic life and my political life all fit together? How should I live these, you know, there, there's only so many, there, there isn't like a rich tradition of grappling with the answers to those questions from first principles about who made the world, why are we here, what is the good life? And I think that that sort of thoughtful consistency, um, which doesn't necessarily have to be um, theistic, but uh, something that traditional theistic religions have done well is that uh, they've thought a lot about those questions and, and uh, there is something to be to learn from that. Mm. Okay. Now, there's a very important thing, ladies and gentlemen, that we neglected to inform you guys of uh, at the start of this, uh, at the start of our event here this evening, and that is the fact that in Braver Angels uh, debate culture, uh, we have uh, something that we do to signify appreciation for our speakers, be they featured or be they our guests, and that is what some people call jazz hands. In sign language, you applaud like this, and it just so happens to be like a jazz hand kind of thing. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause slash jazz hands for Tara Isabella Burton, right? Thank you. Because that was fantastic. And now what I'd like to do is bring in all of you. And so we have, uh, how much time for questions do we have now, uh, Luke? Uh, 30 minutes? Uh, about 30 minutes, yeah. Uh, 30 we minutes? should uh, take the last question about 9.20 p.m. Okay, excellent. And so, folks, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead. If you have a question, raise your hand in the participant box. Uh, Luke, uh, Luke mentioned how to do it, but if you go to participants, you should see the raise hand function. And I will be throwing the list here and calling on people. The first individual I see here is Warren. Uh, Warren, do you have a question for Tara? And if you don't mind, uh, try, yeah. try and keep the question within about, you know, 30 to 45 seconds. And not that make one's it very short. <clears throat> um, yeah. Some months ago, I asked my four grandchildren where they got their spirituality, and they said, no, they, they don't. And I didn't think to question them further, but I know they are very ethical. They have a lot of uh, values of things, which I appreciate, and they tell me those things. But I'm wondering, do you know of some word or some uh, way to reference them to essentially find out where do they get these ideas from? Tara, how can Warren question his grandchildren to get at the source? Of, <laughs> get at the source of these notions they get. They're in their mid twenties, so I'll give you an idea of age. Yeah. Okay, there hmm. Um. So, I think the the language uh, that's you know they're they're in the demographic where it's quite likely, especially if they are spiritual but not religious, that the question of what what is meaningful to you, what gives your life meaning, those kind of questions of of sort of individual. Um, uh, valence have particular weight. So, you know, what, what makes your life worth living? I mean, again, I don't know your grandchildren, but, but sort of 
I think it's, it's quite likely that, you know, if they, they do track uh, along other spiritual but not religious uh, people in their 20s, that they're used to uh, talking about it in a kind of more individual way about their approach to the world rather than seeing themselves as fitting into an established box. Okay. So I think the more, the more targeted an individual, the better. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. I see a hand. Thank you very much, Warren. And I see Thank a you. hand raised from Carrie. Carrie, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask, and ask your question. Yeah. So I was thinking when you were talking about the personal brand of religion, that the, it's, it reminds me of a smorgasbord, you know, picking and choosing what you want. And it also reminded me of um, uh, regional cuisines that are so identifiable. You know, you would expect something very different from, you know, an Ethiopian restaurant or an Italian restaurant or a Hawaiian. And even though there's a commonality to all of them, there's a uniqueness that's very identifiable. And I wondered whether there's something along those lines, any kind of trends that you see developing of the religious smorgasbord turning into a sort of national cuisine. Uh, yeah, I mean, I actually think that's a really good example precisely because of, uh, particularly in a globalized networked uh, capitalist world such as it is, um, the, you know, the whole way in which national cuisine is sort of presents itself and like I you know especially like I live in New York where you know there's a restaurant every block is like you're you have um the luxury of choice you the hypothetical consumer you can consume what you want what feels good what is interesting from here from there from there from there and um this is um kind of this is this is sort of coded as good because it is good for you to have more choices. And I think that same mentality, which is the mentality of the internet, which is the mentality of Netflix algorithms, is also applied to religion. It is not just sort of sustenance in the spiritual sense, but seen as um, something for you, uh, a resource to better your life to consume for your pleasure. Um, I often uh, I think quite critical of that. I think, you know, with my theologian hat on, um, there is uh, something very dangerous in thinking of one's spiritual life as existing for consumption. So I, I think that your example is exactly right. I also think this is a very bad trend in religion and we should resist it. Do you see it developing into something with a particular flavor that's uniquely American? Oh, okay. K Carrie, you, you, you snuck in another question there. That, that I, was meant I, to I, be the same question. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. I'm, happy, I'm happy to continue. I, I, I will allow it, but just the policy here is, is, is one, per, one per customer. But go ahead. Go ahead, Tara. Um, I think that sort of mixy matchiness, remixiness is itself distinctly American. Um, but I think that um, perhaps the kind of best selfism as a which has its roots to and everything from like i said new thought but also the pro, uh, prosperity gospel such a big part of uh, evangelical christian culture um the, that sort of kind of hybrid of transcendentalism capitalism and spirituality as self-help culture and wellness culture are perhaps our most likely um exports, which is to say, um, we may well find that sort of the American uh, self-help culture does become, and indeed is becoming, kind of a broader phenomenon. And that might be the, uh, the American flavor such that it's, uh, it, it proliferates in that form. But I think that it, more, more broadly American religious culture is so diffuse and remixed that you'd be hard pressed to find anything more kind of, for it to calcify in any more, um, more intense way. Okay. Uh, Sam Klinger, go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, hi, Tara. Uh, I really enjoyed your piece on uh, Gabriel D'Annunzio uh, oh. that you wrote in the New York Times last October. And uh, I've been thinking about that piece in the past month or so since uh, the whole Shaz Zone became uh, mm -hmm. in the news uh, with uh, so his name, Ross Simone, he kind of presented himself as kind of a Viennunzio type figure bringing order to this chaos. Uh, do you, as Americans start to lose faith in their institutions and authority becomes more soft rather than hard? 
uh, do you think people will uh, start looking for figures like D'Annunzio who present themselves as a, kind of a strong man figure? Absolutely, and I think they already have. Um, so uh, just a bit of sort of broader backstory for those of you who don't uh, know Gabriele D'Annunzio. Uh, Y'all should, he's fascinating. Um, so uh, 19th century Italian poet, womanizer, dandy, a celebrity gossip columnist, uh, lost all his money in gambling, got lots of beautiful women to give him more, uh, somehow became, uh, in part through the virtue of his poetry, the sort of elder statesman of Italian letters. And after World War I, in which he was a war hero for uh, just flying a plane and dropping a poet poetic propaganda he'd written over Vienna and Trieste, um, decided that he wanted to launch a nationalist campaign to regain the city of uh, Fiume, now Rijeka in Croatia, then part of um, the kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Serbs, Croats, yeah, um, the other one, Slovenes, uh, and that, um, he wanted to uh, retake this uh, city, which had a large Italian-speaking population, for a newly reunited Italy. Uh, he didn't really consult Italy on this. He shows up with like his army buddies uh, in, in the city of Fiume, and from September 12th, 1919, to uh, Christmas of 1920, basically has the, uh, I don't know what we call it, the, uh, the Fiume Autonomous Zone. Um, he sets up this kind of, ostensibly Italian, but really just a dictatorship with uh, fireworks and poetry readings every night, um, where uh, free love reigns supreme, cases of syphilis went up like 3,000%, everyone was on a lot of cocaine, um, and it just became this, this sort of cult of personality that um, ultimately collapsed, but could have captivated the world's attention for a while. And um, Denunz the D'Annunzio playbook, as it were, was um, while he himself uh, was not a fan of uh, his later fascist fans, he was enormously influential in the development of modern fascism. Uh, Mussolini was obsessed with him, constantly went to his house to like try and get um, his support and advice. Um, and the kind of fascist cult of personality politics really came from that failed experiment. And I think that, you know, uh, whatever one might think of, of Trump, certainly his, uh, and certainly he's not exactly the uh, great uh, national poet of America, but the way in which he has been able to blend the kind of rhetoric of masculinity, the rhetoric of a vanished bygone age, the sort of savvy for playing the media game and the, the game of celebrity gossip columnists in order to kind of sell uh, a moral romantic fantasy of um, belonging to something exciting. Because people who liked D'Annunzio, you know, so much of it wasn't just, well, he's powerful, but it's, I can be one of those heroes. I can live in the days of the ancient Roman heroes and that will make my life not just meaningful, but exciting, aesthetically thrilling, like maybe we'll burn it all down, but so what? And I think that um, talking about sort of Donald Trump's election, but also more broadly about the kind of development of the online alt-right, what I also often call the atavistic right, which is the sort of uh, internet reactionaries hearkening to a vanished age, you know, your Jordan Peterson fans, but also your, your men's rights activists on Reddit's red pill and your, you know, full-on alt-right, alt-right white supremacists all have a similar kind of fetishization, not just of an imagined world, but of the kind of excitement of living at this like exciting time in history where we're all gonna go and be part of this kind of catastrophic civil war that's also kind of like a video game. And that kind of aestheticization of politics, I think is so pertinent now. Like I, um, the, the book I'm working on uh, now, my next, my next nonfiction book will have a chapter on D'Annunzio and I'm uh, very excited because I think he's one of the most important figures to understand, to understand 2020. Sarah, we're going to have to bring you back for a separate conversation just to talk about Jordan Peterson because you're oh, anytime. triggering my own reaction. Bring him on too. We'll have a chat. Is, is he like out of his Russian meat coma? What was that now? Wasn't he in a coma in Russia for quite some time? Yes, back? Been, it'll help. Uh, Peterson has been on the Brave Angels uh, podcast in the past, actually, so maybe we can get his uh, attention for you again. That'd be a good one. That would uh, be lovely. Indeed. Uh, Liz Bo uh Liz Boulware, am I, am I getting that right, Liz? Okay, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, um, thank you, Tara. 
I wanted to get your perspective on um, sort of on the lack of grace and forgiveness that we're seeing today as sort of part of this whole, you mentioned social justice warriors, um, pretty much there's no man left standing in a form of a statue. Um, I guess the women, any women statues have been spared, but um, it just seems like now we're almost creating a religion that has no redemption, you know, and, and we go and we look for sin in others as opposed to, you know, forgiving it and understanding, you know, how we're all human. Um, just looking for your input on that. Sure. I mean, I think that I'm often when social justice culture um, uh, and the movement is called a religion, um, the people who do so do, do so pejoratively, um, whether it's Barry Rice, or Andrew Sullivan, it's, you know, oh, it's a cult, it's a religion. Um, I think that's unfair. I think, I think, you know, it does, when I talk about it having elements of a religion, what I mean is that it, it does meet very real uh, spiritual and material, uh, sort of a spiritual hunger and a sort of political hunger for a better world. And I think that one of the reasons it's been so successful is that it recognizes a kind of failure and a particular neoliberal failure of um, visions of the neutral public square. So I think that, you know, I do want to sort of bracket before I answer your question fully, that I think that a, a degree of um, incivility perhaps may be sort of necessary, both rhetorically and tactically to kind of combat the idea that, you know, public, the public sphere, the public square are, are neutral spaces that they can ever be neutral spaces. That said, I think, um, and again, I'm being a bit reductionist because the movement is itself quite ideologically diverse and there's lots of these debates going on right now. Um, but I think that attention that I would identify in the movement that's sort of at, at some of the um, heart of the sort of question of not figuring out redemption is that it's simultaneously a movement that resists um, sort of the sort of intuitionalism and capitalist focus on, you know, self-choice um, with sort of political aims, and yet doesn't really have um, in the, you know, because it is in the world we are in, ways of sort of it, making that solidarity um, work and function. So a question, you know, where does, does evil come from? Does it come from an unjust society, a structurally unfair society, or does it come from the individual and if so can individuals be um you know what, what grace is there for the individual how can an individual kind of be better be forgiven and i think the the, the tension between you know we are individuals we are fallen we are you know we we have a responsibility to do better and we're kind of not quite sure how to fix these systems that are so broken that it's almost daunting to think of, you know, how do we remake an entire system so that it works? There's a sort of a tendency, I think, to go back to looking at individual actors as um, uh, as, as sort of people that we can point to and, and say like, well, you know, we can't fix the whole system, but we can have this person step down from their job. And I, I think that a danger in that is that it sort of does actually buy into the kind of intuitionalism that I've been talking about where like, you know, if you read the right book, you read the right handbook about, um, you know, anti-racism or about um, not being sexist and you're sort of do a kind of internal work, that narrative and that demand, um, while kind of more doable under the system we live in, ultimately doesn't like actually allow itself to really address structural issues. So I think sort of, again, I think that, you know, uh, a, a sort of way of a, a cohesive way of dealing with redemption, with grace, with sort of concepts of, of forgiveness and kind of moving forward do demand a, a resolution of the tensions between, you know, how do we deal with injustice on the level of individuals and how do we remake a better world structurally? Um, which is something that no one person can do. Um, and I think that, that that tension is at the heart of so much. Hmm. Um, Andrew, I see your hand raised. 
Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you. It's been really a fantastic talk. And I read your piece in Commonweal a while ago, and I like the one about the, your whole faith religion journey. Um, sent it to numerous people I knew, including a friend who's becoming a priest, and uh, he really appreciated it. Um, so my question doesn't really have to do with that, but I just had to <laughs> say that. Um, Not to sneak in a compliment. That's fine, Andrew. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, my question is, is about the class element to this, potentially. I think of the fact that one of the counties with the lowest religious adherence rates in the United States is Elliott County, Kentucky, a very working class rural Appalachian County. And in my own life, the friends that I know who, you know, do soul cycle or who are into like, even those who are into like Jordan Peterson uh, tend to be upper middle class. Um, and this is something we've seen with institutional religion has actually also kept a, a greater hold as Tim Carney notes on those who are in the upper echelons of American society. So do these new religions tend to take root more among the middle class and upper middle class, or do some of them predominate more among the working class? Um, I think that by and large, there's, and again, there's, there's not great sort of data about this, um, but these, these specific ways in, in which uh, new religion manifests itself are, I think, largely um, sort of middle and upper, upper middle class phenomenons uh, in origin. But I think that often sort of there's a sort of cultural trickle down effect. Uh, for example, like I'm thinking about wellness, wellness culture is a really great example of this. You know, you start out with your soul cycles with your Gwyneth Paltrow's goop website where you're selling, you know, $100 jade eggs to put in your vagina. But then you're also looking at, for example, the rebrand in 2018 of um, Weight Watchers as WW. Uh, it's, it's no longer Weight Watchers. It's now um, a wellness brand. The W stands for wellness. They've overhauled their system. So, you know, there's more um, meditation apps and um, they have a partnership with Headspace, the meditation app. And there's more of a sense of like, this is about wellness. And I think that that's a really good example of the way in which kind of ideologies that or, or kind of practices that started out as aspirational in one way have become kind of so embedded in the American cultural fabric and kind of also tinged with a bit of an aspirational quality of like, oh, self-care that, that evokes the same kind of advertising feelings as um, glamour might have done in the 1950s. Um, you know, this is something associated with wealth in a certain way and that makes it, you know, more quote unquote desirable. Um, there's not like huge um, statistical variations about the religious, um, the unaffiliated as a whole. They're a little whiter and a little um, better educated than the um, American population at, at large, um, but there's not sort of huge statistical gaps there. Um, but I think the specific ways in which these movements are, um, these sort of the movements that I talk about in my book, wellness, modern occultism and witchcraft, um, kink and polyamory culture and kind of modern free love, um, the tech industry, these of course are very much, uh, especially insofar as they demand a kind of um, focus on um, what communities that are, you know, digital communities, they are, they do demand a bit of leisure time and attention that is itself a privilege. Um, Anissa Scholes, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Earlier, Tara, you said, I wrote it down because I was trying to remember it. Um, you said that uh, someone asked um, for a qualitative, do you have a qualitative opinion about this? And you said, no, you thought more it was a natural and understandable result of something else, this um, remixing of religion. And my question is, if that's the trajectory based on all the factors, um, what do you see as the end game here? And can it be, should it be rerouted from this just dissolution or remixing? Is, is there, will it kind of hit a point where it's a nothingness if it continues in this trajectory? Or will it just keep amorphously reshaping itself into, like I think uh, Carrie mentioned, a, a brand new specific flavor? Yeah. But I think we, we will see. Um, I, I think, and I do predict, sort of interest in movements that are sort of demand a bit more, at least solidarity, a bit more eschatology, a vision of a world. So the purely self, self-focused movements, like I think, you know, wellness culture, um, are, have a bit of a shelf life because I think that there is a sort of inherent loneliness that they, 
um, foster. I think sort of political movements, uh, populist or utopian, might be one uh, one kind of way that people might start to seek one another out. I think um, anecdotally, and this is again purely anecdotal, um, I do see among people my age a resurgence of interest in traditional religion. Um, I think, you know, perhaps from the perspective of this kind of countercultural, like, well, what, what am I going to choose? I'm going to choose the old thing because that's weird. Um, perhaps that's perhaps a bit reductionist, but I think there is a sort of interest in it because it is strange or countercultural. There is that kind of, there is there is sort of a curiosity about that. So I do wonder without making a kind of a, authoritative authoritative statement, whether this might be a, a broader phenomenon than just something that I've noticed anecdotally. Um, but, but I think that there will be a call, and in some ways I think this can be quite, you know, speaking as a Christian here, this, what can be quite good for um, the church would be to kind of recognize its distinctiveness. Because uh, Hillsong and Justin Bieber aside, uh, Christianity cannot and should not compete with, um, you know, soul cycle it should not compete on grounds of being entertaining it cannot com compete on grounds of giving people what they want or want to buy its only distinctiveness can be uh making normative claims about um metaphysical matters and either they're sort of true or they're not and i think that you know churches that you know for example and i'm sort of here showing my, my hand and my bias here, but churches that say, yeah, we believe this guy, he died, came back from the dead, sounds crazy, it's pretty crazy. We literally think that happened, yeah. <laughs> is a kind of move that religions will have to make because that is what the, the sort of claim to truth, to actual foundational metaphysical truth is something that is, is the only, way that I think religious institutions or, or religions can survive because they're not going to survive by like being the flashiest or the shiniest or the sexiest or giving you the best body. Hmm. Luke Holthouse, go ahead and ask your question, sir. Uh, thank you, Tara. Also have very much enjoyed a lot of the Commonweal commentary from recently. Um, kind of following up on that, who do you see in the church and in evangelism who are doing a good job of that like just for one example i was i can understand the jordan peterson dig but i was surprised to see like bishop Barron and included in that dig at jordan mm -hmm. peterson um i he's just someone that i really appreciate and resonate as kind of a like super smart guy who is in tune with all of this stuff and really talented evangelizing mm -hmm. but hey do you see people in either the catholic tradition or just any christian tradition doing a good job of oh. this I think yeah. Dorothy Day did a great job. I think we should pour one out for Dorothy Day. Uh, but more seriously, uh, in terms of the, the contemporary uh, landscape. So I just want to be clear, my, my criticism of Bishop Barron was not wholesale. Rather, um, I am critical and have been critical, and, and even people you know, I'm sort of, of what I see as an alliance on the part of Christian traditionalists, often Catholic traditionalists, with um, people christian or sort of ostensibly christian um like like peter Thiel or jordan peterson but whose sort of ethos is, is much more countercultural, like anti quote-unquote pc culture anti um you know anti the modern world in a particular way and i think that there is an alliance um that i think is very dangerous between um reactionaries who or or between traditionalist Christians who want to, I think, quite fairly criticize the modern world, criticize modern liberalism, criticize, um, but who do so, but who, in order to kind of win cultural points, uh, ally with people I see as being, um, having issues on, on, for example, gender that are, um, that, that are quite reactionary, that are sort of distinct. And I, I, I want to criticize that alliance. Um, I think that there's some, some great um, writers that I admire working in um, sort of smaller outlets. Um, the, the Bruderhof, for example, uh, the sort of Anabaptist community uh, that publishes Plow, uh, a sort of intentional community, community living out Christian values. Um, and uh, their publication, Plow, is, is, uh, which I've, I've written for, so I don't know if I can say it, but they're, I think, are a great example of a Christian voice that is not kind of neat, like, that takes seriously um, 
but that challenges the, the contemporary order, but not from a partisan position. And I think a danger um, both, I mean, I was in that piece in particular cr uh, critical of, um, of, of more right-wing forms of Christianity elsewhere. I've been more, more tr uh, critical of kind of certain traditional, ten uh, sorry, certain progressive tendencies. But I think, um, yeah, I think, I think Plows of Grady Clay or, or uh, Susanna Black, who I think do great writing and editing work, trying to, um, to, to create a more balanced and, and nuanced perspective that doesn't just turn into um, culture war side picking. Thank you. Um, Luke Phillips, I think that you had a question. If you could be concise, good sir, I will allow it. It's quite concise. Uh, Tehran, um, do you think that uh, religion, um, that, uh, that broadly accepted social religion is a foundational and crucial part of any political order in sustaining that political order. Um, and uh, additionally, as a second part to that, uh, with this kind of like pluralistic, individualistic American tradition of religion, um, in its modern guise where it's going like further out into things that haven't traditionally been thought of as religion, is there something fundamentally destabilizing about political order, uh, to, to the political order, about this kind of uh, religious dispensation in America? That's a concise question for Luke. Tara? Well, I think, in, I think that uh, at this sort of liberal atomization uh, that we have is actually uh, not at all destabilizing to the current political order. I think that if anything, it props it up, the idea that sort of we are defined by our sort of individual choices in a particular way that um, sort of uh, aligns any sense of what the common good might be and the metaphysical grounding of it is perfect for uh, a neoliberal capitalist society. Uh, the two go hand in hand. That said, yes, I absolutely think, um, I, d I don't think, I, Without uh, saying that I don't believe in, this, in the uh, separation of church and state, uh, I will not go so far as to say that. I will, however, posit that like, insofar as we are social animals, insofar as we are beings who live by and inherently need meaning and community, um, it is impossible not to think of how we gather and live in community with one another um, without recourse to our religious selves and our political selves. I think that any um, line drawn between those two or between politics as a concept and the like practical act of living with one another um, is, is, you know, aligned sort of truths of, of, of the human condition. So, um, yes, I think all, all religion is inherently political and all politics uh, are inherently religious. And while it may, may be, uh, I don't know, not sold, tactical to, to s separate the two by sort of sheer administrative necessity, it comes at the cost of a very real, um, I, I, it comes at the cost of an account of the human condition that must always be fundamentally incomplete. Mm. Okay. Stan, you are going to have our last question of the evening. Go ahead, Stan. Stan, go ahead and unmute yourself. I'll try to make it uh, simple. Um, I've noticed in a lot of the practitioners in traditional religions, many different ones who are my friends, there's much less emphasis uh, within each individual on the spiritual worship, much less time, much less effort, and a lot more time and effort spent on the social gatherings. Uh, and over time, that seems to be more and more. Do you see that as an effect on moving people away from traditional religion, or how do you see that affecting, if any? Sure. I mean, I think a caveat that I want to make here that I didn't make earlier is that some of this is not new, which is to say, um, I've talked about remix culture, but you know, they were practicing divination and witchcraft alongside and folk magic in, you know, America in 1795. And likewise too, 
it is also true that is ne it has never been the case that everybody in a given pew you know fully like do they fully all fully believe the every word of the nicene creed when they recite it probably not so i think that you know it has always been the case that, that communal element has been um a huge part of religious life for many people and belief perhaps less so um that said i think institutionally i think once religions relinquished the metaphysical high crown with the distinctiveness of communities and polities defined by very particular radical understandings of what it means to be in the world, who created the world, why are we here, what is the good life. Once communities get divorced from this question, there's a very real danger that um, a religious community like any other group, uh, like a fandom or a, you know, a any other kind of society of affinity can be one that is sort of interchangeable with any other. That it's just, you know, you pick where you want to spend your time and what you find pleasant, what tribe you want to be part of. So I do think that that danger is intensified by a kind of de-emphasis on the theology. Indeed. Well, Tara Burton, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, a round of a round of applause, visual applause, jazz hands, if you will, <laughs> for Dr. Tara Isabella Burton. And uh, Tara, thank you. That was so much fun. And uh, I hope it's lovely. Yes, I hope you don't mind us pestering you to uh, to join us uh, to join us again. Uh, no, no, anytime. You know, have me on. Have me and Jordan Pearson on. We'll have a great chat. Um, <laughs> Excellent. Or just have me talk about Denunzio. That's fine. I could do that for hours. Yeah. Well, I'm, that's so. I'm gonna look up that piece after we're after we're done here. I expect other people will too. So yes. Yeah, so thank you, Tara, ladies and gentlemen. Tara, I think is going to become a regular fixture, semi regular fixture at Braver Angels. We will we will pester her until it is so. By <laughs> Anytime. And um, yes, and so if you are interested in her book, Strange Rights, go ahead and look in the chat. You will, if you scroll up a bit, you will see a link. Uh, to that book, so you can go ahead and pick up a copy yourself. Um, in addition to that, if this conversation has been valuable to you, if the work of Braver Angels, our effort to restore the civic foundation of American life so we can pursue truth and the greater good together across lines of political and cultural and religious division is something that you believe in, then please, by all means, join us as a member. Uh, you will find a link now in the chat box to allow you to do just that. Uh, Braver Angels is a membership organization. We are, let me step back and say, the largest grassroots bipartisan organization in America dedicated to the work of political depolarization and really just sort of creating the context um, for the sort of restoration of a larger sense of shared community in American life across all of these different divides. And so I think that one of the things that's interesting about the idea of religion as something that binds us, right, in a community is the idea of religion as something that gives us a framework for working together, a framework for sharing truths and pursuing common ends. Um, in that sense, uh, I hesitate to refer to Braver Angels as a religious organization, but I do say that we are seeking to build up some of that, you know, culture of connection for which uh, religion exists. And uh, in that way, we invite each and every one of you to fellowship with us, so to speak, uh, in our efforts towards creating a more sort of a more sort of unified society in that way. And so, okay, um, well, here we are. Thank you guys all very much, Tara. We look forward to seeing you to seeing you again. And uh, everybody else, we are building a house united. And so come back and join us next week. Check out the Braver Angels calendar on the website to see what events are coming up next. And we look forward to talking to everybody very soon. Thank you, folks. All right, everybody have a good night.